Shabbat Shalom. Let's turn to Galucha, Galatians, and we're in chapter 2 this week. Galatians chapter 2. Now, before we get into the text, I want to remind you and speak to you a little bit about this to give us some perspective. As a ministry, we receive correspondence today electronically, email, from all over the world, from different congregations that are congregating on Shabbat, on the feasts, on the festivals, from all over the world. We get letters every week, tons of them. And Brother John and Steve are the main guys that respond to those letters. They get to see everything because it comes into the ministry from different congregations all over the world. And they get to see everything that is written and then they get to respond. And what we find as a ministry is there is often a common theme from the various congregations, whether it be Malaysia, South Africa, Texas, common questions, common things within those congregations that come up concerning what's going on in those congregations and questions about the doctrine that is taught from this ministry. All that to say this, they seeing everything often answer those congregations the same way. Or maybe it'd be slightly different. But those congregations that get the answer only see the answer. They don't see what the other congregations got to see. Why do I say that? Because I want to remind you that as we're in the Scripture and we're in the book of Galucha, Galatians, Rav Shaliak Shaul, Rabbi Apostle Paul, he answered questions from many congregations throughout the dispersion. And oftentimes, those questions that were asked and answered of one congregation really might give you the answer to something that was going on in another congregation. Because Brother John who sees all of the letters that come into this congregation, can answer pretty much most of the things that are going on in the various assemblies all over the world because he sees all of their questions. Am I right or am I wrong? So, as we get into Galatians chapter 2, let's use the Scripture as a dictionary for the scripture, you don't have to listen to my opinion, but let's listen now to what this, how the scripture defines the scripture. I love the concrete method of study because then you don't have to be, upon, be based upon supposition, perspective, or somebody's opinion. But we use the scripture as a dictionary for the scripture. And we will find the answer to what's going on in Galatians, the book of Galatians, by, in fact, the answer that was given to the Ephesians. Because the answer that was given to the Ephesian congregation actually tells you what was going on in Galatians. So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11. And Ephesians chapter 2, specifically verse 11, will have 10 points in Ephesians that clearly tell us what was going on. And we can see now that this answer was going out to the congregations in the dispersion. And these 10 simple points will help us get the right perspective of, in fact, not only what was going on in Ephesus, but what was going on in Galatia to the dispersed congregants, whether they were in Galatia or Ephesus. They had common questions about what was going on with the faith that Rav Shaliak Shaul was delivering to the saints. Ten simple points. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Number one. Therefore, remember, you were once called Gentiles in the flesh. That's the first thing. Whoever is being addressed, they were once called Gentiles in the flesh. They were cast off. They were called Gentiles by a group of Jews. Number two. Who were called uncircumcision. The Greek word there is acrobustie. And it means you tossed away your foreskins. You just tossed them away. You tossed away the covenant because the foreskin is attached to the covenant of Abraham. You just tossed away that covenant. That speaks of the ten northern tribes that were scattered into the nations. What is called by the circumcision... Made in flesh by hands. So the circumcised Jews were calling those that were uncircumcised. They tossed away their foreskins. The acrobustie. They tossed away the covenants of promise given to Abraham. Of which circumcision was an entry sign. Number three. That you, at time, you were without Mashiach. They were lost. They didn't know Messiah. Number four, you were aliens and strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. You were not part of the congregation of Israel. You were outsiders. You were not part of the congregation of Israel. Number five, you were in fact strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without Elohim in the world, but now in Mashiach, Yahusha, You who? So we have the fifth point here. These people, they were were strangers. They were cut off from the covenants of promise that were given to Abraham. The context here we can see is what? It is all about the promises given to who? Abraham. And the sixth point, you were once far off. You had been tossed away. But you have been, number seven, brought near, brought in the context into the assembly of Israel by the blood of Yahusha. And how did that happen? By a blood ratified book of the covenant. And number eight, for he himself is our peace who has made both one. And he has broken down the middle wall of separation. So there's this middle wall of separation, a construct, a false construct that has been erected by the Jews. And now Yahusha, and through the message that Rav Shaliak Shaul is, is taken out to the nation, this false construct has now fallen down, and those that were afar off are brought into Israel by the covenants of promise, which are established through the blood ratification of Yahusha, and that there is no longer a divided nation, there is no longer a divided priesthood, and there is no longer a divided temple. That false construct is gone. And number nine, having abolished in his flesh, something happened in his body, crucifixion, in his flesh that abolished the enmity that is the law. Whoa, what law? The book of the law, Galatians 3.10, of commandments contained in ordinances. That's commandments contained in ordinances, not commandments contained in covenant. And finally, number 10, so as to create himself one new man from the two From the book of the law and the book of the covenant, he now brings in one new man through the blood ratification of Yahushua. This right here addresses what's going on in Galatians, not only what's going on with the Ephesians, but it really is the answer to what's happening in Galatia. Look at chapter and verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up to Jerusalem, Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. 
So the question that you have to ask, is this 14 years after Shaul's three-year period in Saudi Arabia, A, and that would be 2 Corinthians 12, 2 for your reference, or 14 years including the three-year period, B, because this has been much debated over the history of man as he's been approaching this book of Galatians. And it will directly affect your reading of the book of Acts as to whether this Jerusalem visit is the Acts 15 visit or not. And how you answer that is going to really affect your conclusions that you draw from reading the book of Galatians. Now, I believe personally that the text leans more heavily toward A, that this is actually 14 years after Shaul's three-year period in Arabia, chapter 1, verse 17. He then would have gone up to Jerusalem for the first time to meet with Kiefer and Yaakov, chapter 1, verse 18. And here, chapter 2, verse 1, is written before Shaul's first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13 and 14. But before, but before the Jerusalem council of Acts chapter 15, making this journey to Jerusalem, verse 1, the one spoken of in Acts chapter 11. So you've got to spend that time before you can even dive in to establish how you're even going to pull out from the book of Galatians. Because after Shaul's Damascus Road experience, I believe he went down to Jabal al-Lawaz, which is the real Mount Sinai in Saudi, Saudi Arabia today. And he communed, I believe, like I said last week, with Yahuwah in the cave of Elijah. And you find that in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, where he would have meditated for three years as he studied through the triennial cycle of the Torah because he would be looking to try and reformulate all of his ideas, base teaching. And the best way to do that would have been to spend that three years going through the triennial cycle of studying the Torah, now with the mindset that the covenant has been blood ratified and there is now a transference from the book of the law into the book of the covenant Torah for the people of Yahuwah. This is amazing to me because he wouldn't have been down in that cave of Elijah for three years learning pagan syncretism and lawlessness, would he? There's no way. There's no way that he would have been doing that. So how do we come up with this false construct today that the Apostle Paul, St. Paul, teaches paganism and syncretism? There's no way that he would have learned that isolated, meditating with Yahuwah for three years, I believe, going through the triennial cycle that the context and the history of the culture testifies to. But he would have been given the revelation in those three years of how Israel's promises were attached to the conditional arm of the book of the covenant which they broke, and then Yahushua's blood ratified and gave them back entrance in. Now, again, I want to bring up Avi Ben Mordecai's book and commentary, Galatians, because it's fabulous on page 172 of his commentary, Galatians. He has the title, Two Torahs. Two Torahs. And that's totally acceptable to the Hebrew roots and Messianic movement. No problem. You can say there's two Torahs as long as you say it's the oral Torah and the written Torah. Based upon no textual evidence, but it pulls at our heartstrings. And it pulled at my heartstrings over a decade ago too, and I accepted that. But my point in bringing this up is people have no problem with accepting the premise of two Torahs, as long as you tow the party line and it's the oral Torah, oral law, and the written law. We can have two Torahs. But you bring up scripture that there's the book of the law, Torah, and the book of the covenant, Torah. One was added for transgression, the book of the law, and oh my God. Goodness, that's just unacceptable. Where's the equal weights and measures? 
Because obviously the Ark of the Covenant contained the Book of the Covenant, and on the outside, Deuteronomy 31, there was another book separate that witnessed against them called the Book of the Law, two Torahs, a rightly dividing point of the Torah. You see, so we have to admit that religion does not like to use equal weights and measures. Because on page 172, for over a decade, it's been totally acceptable within the Hebrew roots and messianic movement to have two Torahs. No problem. As long as it's not, as long as it's not Book of the Law and Book of the Covenant, we will accept Book of the Covenant and Book of the Law. No way. But that is in the manuscripts, whether it is in the Masoretic text, whether it's in the Septuagint, whether it's in the Greek Brit Hadashah. It's attested to in manuscriptural evidence. But this idea of a written law, an oral law, that has no textual basis. It is supposition based upon Jewish tradition and the rabbis. And that's accepted. It's asinine when you really look into it. It's a false construct. It's a false construct. And we've got to tear down the middle wall of separation. It's pure theory, this written law and oral law dichotomy. And it does, I admit, it does tug at your heartstrings. It really does. But there is no Hebrew minchag, takonot, gezanot, ma'asim, or its Greek equivalent in any New Testament texts. Can we be real? But those words are floated around and, oh yes, wow, this is really high Hebraic learning. And it sounds so, whoop, these are big fancy words. Minhag, takanot, you know? And we love that stuff. I used to, until you kind of peel through it and you see it's just a religious veneer. You really do. Why do people get their seat seat in a knot? When I state that there's two Torahs, the book of the law and the book of the covenant, based upon textual evidence, it's in the Bible, it's in Torah, it's in the Brit, it's in the Hebrew, it's in the Greek, it's in the Septuagint, it's in the Masoretic, it's everywhere. <laughs> but it's outrageous that you would say that there's two Torahs. Well, but for a decade on a page 172, you've had no issue. See? Just tell the truth. You know, be consistent. Be consistent. I just want people to be consistent. I want them to follow through. Tie a string around it and see where it leads you. Religious false construct. Whether it's pagan syncretism or rabbinic takanot. There you go. Big word for you. Look at verse 2. And I went up by sowed revelation and communicated to them concerning the Bessorah that I proclaim among the nations, the gospel among the nations, but privately to them whom were of tov good reputation, lest by any means I should labor or had labored in vain. What made Shaul the Apostle Paul's Bessorah gospel so different. Non-Jewish believers didn't have to convert into the Jewish structure or construct of religion and follow their interpretation of that construct. And their interpretation of that construct was through a book of the law interpretation. But they now were brought in through blood-ratified covenant. This is good news because it's torn down the middle wall of separation. You see, before Shaul's message, the adherents of the book of the law status quo believed one's ethnic status as a Jew assured redemption. But that's simply not so. Whereas Shaul's message was concurrent with the covenant of Abraham, and it overturned this deeply embedded social concept and social construct. And that's what we're up against. Circumcision 
and the book of the law had become, listen, this is key, circumcision and the book of the law had become the nationalistic boundary marker ever since the Seleucid invasion, 1 Maccabees 1. If you weren't circumcised and following their interpretation of the book of the law, you were not part of the nation. Simple as that. That was their false construct. And Rav Shaliak Shaul's message demolished that false construct because it was all about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Read it again. That is the book of the law, book of the covenant dichotomy explained through scripture in Ephesians 2, verse 11. And it is solid. It's concrete. It's reliable. It's not my theory. I didn't come up with this. No man could come up with this. This is the power of the word of Yahuwah. But you have to be able to question religion and the status quo. Shaul was restoring the covenants of promise and Yahusha's blood ratification. They were the nationalistic boundary markers that were established back in Genesis chapter 12. Verse 3, But neither Titus, who was with me, being an Aramean, was compelled to be circumcised immediately. You see, Judaism is blinded in both eyes. Both eyes. They're blinded when it comes to circumcision because they believe that circumcision today is the entrance sign into the covenant of Abraham. It was once. But once the covenant was broken, why would you circumcise into a broken covenant? Makes no point. That's why those that were raised in the wilderness didn't get circumcised with no chastisement from Yahuwah and no chastisement from Moshe Rabbeinu. Because what's the point in circumcising into a broken covenant? Circumcision today is a land entrance sign only. Joshua 5, reestablished by Ezekiel when he was speaking to the nations. It's got nothing to do with, with the covenant of Abraham today. So Judaism's one eye there is blinded because their false construct again is circumcision still attaches to Abraham. No, it doesn't. That covenant was broken. They're blinded in the other eye because they're blinded to who the blood ratification, the one that walked through the pieces is. Yahusha. It's the blind leading the blind. And they both fall into the ditch of religious syncretism. Either lawlessness or rabbinic paganism also. It really is. Look at verse 4. And because of false Israelite brothers who had sneaked in, those sneaky little, they sneaked in, and who came in secretly to spy out our liberty that we have in Moshiach Yahusha, that they might bring us back into slavery. The Greek word here is pseudo delphos. Pseudo, meaning false, just like unto today. What does it mean? We've got these sham believers. We call them the synagogue of Satan. They're sham believers. Katakopio in the Greek, it means they sneaked in. Kataskopio, they sneaked in. Meaning they gate crashed into the private meeting between Shaul and the Jerusalem leaders. Causing problems because they were pushing their own agenda. And then we have, of course, everybody wants to know, what is this liberty that we have? Give me liberty or give me death, right? Is that what it's talking about? Well, no, because that was 1775, right? Patrick Henry speaking to the British globalists. Give me liberty or give me death. Well, no, it's liberty. Christ liberated me from the law of Moses so I can now dance around a maypole and erect a Christmas tree. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I'd love to have a pork sandwich. No, I wouldn't. That's outrageous. 
But this is the common religious construct. Liberty to lawlessness? Asinine. But this has been peddled for 2,000 years by churchmen because some funky monk back in the 1500s wanted to have a roasted swine because that was cheap food and they all loved to pig out on it. So some funky monk got in there and messed with the text. And we're all inheritance of it because we're fleshly carnal people and we're like, don't mess with my luau. Right? Wrong. Let's be honest with the text. The problem with this interpretation that you can now go and do anything, eat anything, erect a Christmas tree and do any kind of pagan syncretism because you're in Christ Jesus, the problem with this false construct is 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Sin is defined as a violation of the Torah. Sin is violation of the law. So in essence, you're saying the law of Christ is sin. Is that what you're saying? You are. You're saying that the law of Christ that you're now under is sin. And you are actually under sin and you've shackled yourself to sin. Christ died so you could sin without being charged is basically what you're saying. Christ died so that I could sin without being charged. And we haven't even addressed that all-encompassing pagan syncretism, hedonism, and general dumbing down of the word to a fifth-grade level in churches today. And that's what it is. It's the dumbing down of the Bible to a fifth-grade level. And most people are like, uh -huh. Yeah, it'll be over here in a minute so I can have my go out for my Sunday lunch and my pork pulled sandwich. Right? Let's go to Red Lobster. I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious, but you know it's all true. Right? You remember those big Sunday lunches after service, and you weren't going to a kosher deli. You lying mama. <laughs> okay? Come on, right? What is this elusive eleutheria in the Greek liberty that Shaul is speaking of if it's not liberty to lawlessness? And it's not liberty from the law of Moses as a whole, as the institutionalized church has taught us. We are at liberty from the book of the law, Galatians 3.10, because Yahusha's blood has ratified the new covenant, which was given as Torah, Jeremiah 31, verse 31, and Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Not at liberty to lawlessness, heaven forbid. We are at liberty to covenant Torah, which is distinct and different from imposed book of the law, which was the schoolmaster and tutor until the time of Reformation. There are two Torahs. Page 172 of Avi's book acknowledges that. But the false construct is the theory of a written law, an oral law construct, when the scriptures teach that the reality is a book of the law is Torah added for transgression, or book of the covenant, which is Torah that was given as the promises and covenant to Abraham. Amen. Somebody read to me from Corinthia Bet, 2 Corinthians, nice and loud, chapter 3, verse 17. Who's got a nice, loud voice? 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 17. Don't fight all at once. I'm going to have a <laughs> cup of tea. Keep on, give me more. Therefore, we are not weary of this service, just as we are not weary of the Reformation, which is your seat. And so we do not wage war, but have renounced the hidden things of sin, not practicing sin, nor handling the word of law for a true sin, but by the manifestation of the elect, the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of the Lord. Though Paul wrote to us, though it was written, to determine 
Amen. Well, that was my beautiful reading, but I, I skipped you 10 verses ahead. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. And let's give, let's, um, yeah, 17. Let's, we have a mic. My fault, totally mis, 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 misspoke there. I was like, wow, that sounds familiar. <laughs> Somewhat. 2 Corinthians 3, 7. Because when he started off in, in verse 17, it was really the back end of, of the beginning. So yes, I was like, this sounds familiar, but I'm missing so much. Let's give it a whirl. Thank you, brother. But if the administration of death, ah, now that's written right. and engraved in stones, was full of so much tiferous glory that Benai Israel, the house of Israel, could not behold the face of Moshe for the tiferous glory of his countenance, which tiferous glory was not lasting, why then should not the administration of the Ruach spirit be with even more tiferous glory? For if the administration of condemnation was with Tiferous glory, much more does the administration of Zedekah, righteousness, exceed in Tiferous glory. Mm. For even that which was made in Tiferous had no Tiferous in this respect, by reason of the Tiferous that exceeds it. For if that which was not lasting was with Tiferous, how much more that which remains is full of Tiferous. Seeing then that we have such Tikva, we speak and conduct ourselves bravely. Amen. We have a hope that means that we can speak and conduct ourselves bravely. And this is a brave message in a brave new world. Hopefully it's a new world as of um, decisions made this week. I'm looking for a King Cyrus moment, but you never know, right? I mean, we hope so. But 2 Corinthians 3, 7, thank you, brother, informs us that what was on, inscribed on stones condemned the children of Israel because they broke it. What did they break? They broke the covenant. Later, in Deuteronomy chapter 27, that book of the law, that book of the law was inscribed on stones and that was a ministry of death. And Deuteronomy 31 informs us the book of the law witnessed against them for breaking the book of the covenant. But even that ministry of death was glorious, that book of the law. Why? Because it was imposed by Yahweh and it saved the nation from annihilation and destruction, right? You see, the ministry of the book of the covenant is spirit. It's ruach. It's a ministry of righteousness. Because the book of the law was passing away. And the book of the covenant, which remains, is even more glorious. It's that veiled face. The shining face of Moses. Veiled Old Testament language. This can be nothing else. 2 Corinthians 3, 7. But the revelation of the book of the law, book of the covenant dichotomy. He who has ears and eyes to see, let him see. There is liberty, yes. The book of the covenant is spirit because Yahusha's blood ratified that new book of the covenant. There's your liberty. There's your liberty. Because people have questioned, what is this liberty that we have? There it is, right there. Slavery, beware of slavery. Katadulo, to reduce to slavery or to enslave in the Greek. In the Septuagint, it comes to us in um, Shemo, Exodus chapter 1, verse 14. It speaks of Israel's slavery in Egypt. 
And like we've said numerous times before, it's asinine to say that Israel was delivered from slavery to go to the mountain to receive the book of the covenant, which then put them under bondage and slavery. Then you're just exchanging one tyrant for another tyrant, and you're calling Yahweh a tyrant. That makes no sense. He delivered them from slavery so that he could bring them to freedom, which is covenant fidelity. They broke the covenant, and then they enslaved themselves back under the law, the book of the law, the schoolmaster, the tutor, until the time of Reformation, because they were naughty schoolchildren that had to be managed by a Levitical priesthood until the greater priesthood came and transferred them back to liberty. Give me liberty through Yahusha's death. That is what it's really about. So, We now look at verse 5. To whom we gave no place to those sons of... No place by yielding in submission to them. No, not even for an hour that the emet, the truth of the gospel, might remain among you. Verse 6. But those who were considered to be somewhat important, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. Yahweh accepts no man's person. For those who seem to be somewhat important added nothing additional or new to me. You see, Shaul isn't disparaging the twelve with this remark. He is simply communicating that he has been given the full revelation of the book of the law, book of the covenant dichotomy, and how it relates to circumcision and the inclusion into the people of Israel. That's what he's saying. That's what he's communicating. Verse 7. But on the contrary, when they saw that the Besora, the gospel of the Acrobustie, those tossed away circums, they tossed away their circumcision because they broke the covenant, tossed away foreskins, was committed to me, as was the gospel to the Brit Milar to Kiefer. For He that worked vigorously in Kiefer for his calling, verse 8, as a shaliach, an apostle, to the Brit Milah, the circumcised, the same one was mighty in me towards those scattered and cast off, tossed away into the nations. And verse 9, and when Yaakov, Kiefer, and Yochanan, who seem to be pillars, you've got to be careful of the false construct, because who are the pillars of the church? Is it St. Paul, really Jupiter, when you go to Rome and you go to the, um, where is that place they go to in Rome? Thank you. Vatican, you can go up and you can, you know, kiss um, Jupiter, renamed as St. Peter. It's Jupiter. You know, give him a bit of spit and polish on his shiny foot. I mean, really, I mean, this this is the pagan syncretism. They took Jupiter, the idol of Jupiter, brought him into the Vatican. They renamed him Peter. And now, um, no, is it Peter? Yeah, okay. And everyone goes along and gives them a little kiss on the foot. They're kissing Jupiter. Likewise, when everyone stands around with a candle and sings Christmas hymns to a tree, I mean, they're doing nothing different than what Jeremiah told us not to do back in the eighth chapter of the book of Jeremiah. This is pagan syncretism and you're worshipping worshiping demons. And you wonder why you've got so much depression, oppression, and repression in your lives. I mean, you're just in bondage to it. But then you start speaking truth and you get judged by your family because they love that stuff. They love that stuff. Okay? Who are the pillars? Who are the pillars of the faith? They are Yaakov, Kiefer, and Yochanan. So let's make sure that we uphold those pillars. They were perceived with unmerited favor that was given to me. They gave to me and Barnava, Barnabas, the right hand of Chavura, friendship, that we should go to the nations and they should go to the Brit Milah, the circumcised. Now we're in verse 10. Only they desired that we should remember the poor. That same mitzvah, which I was also eager to do. But when Kepha had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was at fault. And now we get into the infamous chapter 2 where we now can go to the hot dog stand. 
No, but this is how it's been interpreted for millennia, right? This is now taking our faith and using it as a license to sin. No, we must stand up to that false construct because this is one of the most ripped out of context verses in the whole of the New Testament, these next set of verses. And before we start, we have just got to be honest in our approach to the text. There is so much, let's be honest, look at the text, there is so much that we are not told. Can we be honest about that? There's so much that we're not told. And what we are told of in this text, well, even most of that is an illusion. Let's be honest. You can't just wade into this, oh yes, well there's the mustard and there's the hot dog. I mean, you can't. You have to be honest that we are, there's a lot missing here. So we've got to tread very gingerly to be honest in our approach to the Scripture. Let's back up a little bit. History will tell us that a Roman becoming circumcised would have been anathema to his people. A Roman becoming circumcised? That would have been outrageous in their cultic ritual. A betrayal. Caligula, in 40 of the Common Era, he had insisted that a statue of himself had been set up in the Jerusalem temple. Can we remember that? Outrageous. The nationalism that surrounded circumcision, it had its roots in the Maccabean era. The vestments of the Levitical high priest, they were kept for safekeeping by the Romans. The vestments of the high priest, they were kept for safekeeping by the Romans. Gentiles had to be circumcised to enter into certain geographic locations, otherwise they would be killed. Killed. Trust-like conversion was the only acceptable entry point into the assembly of Israel. Jews certainly certainly didn't eat or go to the place of those from the nations. And we're not even in the text yet, but we've got to be honest with what was going on at the time. And all of this was allowed. All of this was allowed and condoned under the book of the law aristocracy. Yet it was in absolute contradiction to the divine mandate of the book of the covenant promised to Abraham, which is what? That all peoples, all peoples on earth shall be blessed through you. That is what we're talking about here. Verse 12. For certain men came from Yaakov. In the Greek, Elthian, Tinasa, Apo, Lachabu. It doesn't necessarily mean they were actually from Yaakov, does it? They were just associated with Yaakov in some way. Or more likely, they just claimed that they came from James. They just claimed that they came from James. For when certain men came from Yaakov, or claimed they came from Yaakov, he did eat with the peoples. But when they had come, he withdrew and separated himself. The Greek word here is very telling. Hupastelon. Hupastelon. It means he began to withdraw. What does that mean? He began to withdraw. You see, Kepha was gradually withdrawing. I mean, he could have stopped... By, you know, first of all, he decided he was going to miss supper. I'm going to skip supper with him. And then the next thing, he's like, well, actually, you know, I think I'm going to miss supper and, and the morning meal. I'm going to miss that with him too now. I'll just stop by for a snack, maybe a siesta at midday. I'm not going to do dinner and breakfast with him anymore. So he began to gradually withdraw. 
And you see that, don't you, in relationships today, right? Wow, we used to have... Then they stopped coming around to my camp. They were coming around to my camp every night during Sukkot, and then they were there in the morning as well. And then they stopped coming around in the morning and just came around at dinner time. And then they stopped coming altogether. But we see that with human relations, right? It's a gradual withdrawing. A gr- we see that with our natural human relations. This is what was going on. Or it could mean that he began his meals with the non-Jews, but then he would get up before they finished and he would begin to withdraw and finish his meals with the Jews only. All that to say that he was gradually withdrawing. We have to admit this. Because the verb... Afrohizo sums it up nicely. To remove one party from other parties so as to discourage or eliminate contact. That's what was going on. Fearing, back into our text, fearing them that were from the Yahudim, from the Jews in Jerusalem, and the other Yahudim, they began to join him in the hypocrisy so that even Barnabas, he was even led astray with their hypocrisy. Now, Shaul only took action when the behavior began to spread like a cancer. Now, if this meeting, as many suppose, which I believe is incorrect, if this meeting was the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15 and not the relief mission of Acts 11, it would seem hard to me to see how Kiefer could so easily violate the council's decision. If the council had made this decision then how could he so easily violate it? Conversely, I believe all these issues were the issues that were later actually brought up to the Jerusalem Council that then they made a ruling precisely because of these issues. That happened later. That makes way more sense to me. Because the issue specifically that is going on here is one of eating food, prepared by uncircumcised Israelites. I'm not eating that stuff. Right? And even today with the Orthodox Jews, they're not going to pre- eat something prepared by uncircumcised, by the goyim, as they would say. That's the issue. One of eating food prepared by uncircumcised Israelites. Israelites who were not following the Jewish book of the law interpretation in regard to circumcision. Thus they were deemed still to be unclean and sinners unfit for table fellowship. And Kiefer, he totally caved in to this peer pressure from the book of the law club that had come down from Jerusalem. See, Shaul, here in this text, he was rebuking Kiefer for his hypocrisy. He had been accepting these uncircumcised, according to the book of the Covenant Torah, until some Jewish traditionalists came down, and then, because of the peer pressure, he began to withdraw from table fellowship. And Masa Shlechim, Acts chapter 10, verse 28, it already tells us that he had a problem with this anyway. Because in Acts chapter 10, Verse 28, we can see that Kepha, Peter, he had a history of interpreting the book of the law through this traditionalist Jewish interpretation. It's unlawful for a Jewish man to keep company or go with one from another nation. But Elohim has shown me that I shouldn't call any man common or unclean. Acts chapter 10, verse 28, covenant Torah does not teach this, though. You see, the Galatian community was being welcomed back into the fold of blood-ratified covenant, given as Torah, Hebrews 8, 6. Come just as you are because of the redemptive ratification of Yahushua's blood. Whereas the Jerusalemites, Jerusalemites, excuse me, they were still vacillating between maintaining the exclusivity in regards to national entry of the book of the law and the liberty granting covenant status of a blood ratified book of the covenant. That's what the struggle was. 
And being a prush or a Pharisee means what? A separatist. He was being a separatist from his exiled Israelite brothers in Antioch. Kepha, in fact, stood self-condemned because he violated the very gospel that he had gone and spoken to Cornelius about. He was self-condemned because of his own hypocrisy. This starts to make so much sense. Now, just as Moshe Rabbeinu opposed Pharaoh, now we see that Shaul opposes Kepha because both Pharaoh and Kepha were doing the same thing. They were trying to enslave Israel, right? They were both doing the same thing. They were trying to enslave Israel. This has nothing to do with hot dogs, ham sandwiches, and Canadian bacon. It doesn't. I'm not in fifth grade anymore. True table fellowship must come about because we prevail from the slavery that the nations try to put us in. And for true table fellowship to prevail, it has got to be focused on Yahuwah, both in consumption and conversation. When we're sitting down, what we consume and what we have a conversation about it must be Yahweh-centric for it to be true table fellowship. So don't say you're having table fellowship when you're talking about baseball and football. Because for true biblical table fellowship, it must be Yahweh-centric in consumption and conversation. Remember that. When you have people around to your house, at Sukkot, when you're sitting around campfires, for it to be true fellowship, what is consumed and what is spoken about, it has to be all about Yahweh. Otherwise, you're no different than the nations. And we're a people of fellowship, are we not? The sharing of a common meal, it is critical. It is critical to the sharing of good faith and community, consumption, and conversation. And all of us in here stand convicted. I know I myself do. Not on what I consume, but sometimes, like you, you can get caught up in conversation, and it's no longer fellowship, is it? Because we are bringing the world into our table fellowship, and then it's no longer table fellowship. Verse 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the emet of the Bessora, the truth of the gospel, I said to Kepha in front of them all, if you, being a Yahudi in the light, live like the Arameans in the darkness and not as do the Yahudim, why do you compel the peoples then to live in darkness, to live just like the Yahudim in the light? The Greek here is very telling again. Post ta ethne anakasian idusian. Why do you compel the nations to Judaize? Why do you compel the nations to Judaize? Now it's telling because if you go back to the Septuagint, you will find that in the book of Esther in chapter 8, verse 17. So now it's going to give us our context because the scripture is the dictionary for the scripture. The pastor is not the dictionary for the scripture. The rabbi is not the dictionary for the scripture. The scripture is the dictionary for the scripture. The cemetery, seminary, is not the dictionary for the scripture. And now we go to the book of Esther, chapter 8, verse 17, and we find the context is Gentiles were circumcised and became Jews for the fear of the Jews. Gentiles became circumcised and became Jews for the fear of the Jews. So Kepha's behavior was a vexing separatist behavior that if left to run its course unchallenged would push Gentiles into Judaic proselyte conversion and a return to the book of the law status quo as interpreted by those in Jerusalem. The Greek idiosio or the Hebrew yachad, means to pose as a Jew. We keep running into the synagogue of Satan, don't we? Those who pose as Jews. 
They've totally infiltrated the Hebrew roots and the Messianic mo- They're posers. Absolute posers. And you call them out, and then you keep on speaking the truth. And then there's a separation. Now, this does not mean that Kiefer had abandoned the law of Moses to go to the diner. As is often interpreted. I must have picked that up from catfish. (laughs) That is not how I interpreted it, my friend. I told you one time when I was heavily entrenched in the uh, messianic movement, I was down at a conference, you know, and we'd get people from the, your neck of the woods with these, you know, crazy southern accents trying to speak Hebrew. <laughs> and, you know, because that's what it was all about. Yeah, well, my Hebrew is better than your Hebrew. You know, so you're all a bunch of posers trying to out Hebraic the next person, right? And this guy comes up, and instead of saying teshuva, repentance, he's like, I'm the whole sermon, I'm teshuva. And when they, rem- they, they said teshuva, and you know, we're all like, what the heck? It's like, just be a Tennessean. <laughs> repentance is quite acceptable. We understand. But this. So anyway, it's just this religious construct that just creeps in. Kiefer's behavior and actions, though he was a Jew, they were a lot more consistent with what? The sinners, those in the nations. That's what the text tells us. Kiefer was guilty of creating a schism. A schism between these two groups. And that's just what we have today. But the unifying gospel is how we started out. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. And we'll see it. In four verses below, in verse 18. For we who are from the Yahudi, verse 15, by nature are not from the peoples, the sinners. There it is. Knowing that a man is not ever declared right by the works of the law. Oh, this is outrageous. I mean, get out your nearly inspired version, your New English Bible, or if any of you has the complete Jewish Bible, Let's all make up a fairy tale based upon no textual evidence. But man, it sure sounds good. Nobody would be smart enough to check out the translation that we're totally fabricating this. That's the NIV, the complete Jewish Bible and the New English Bible. Totally make up these next verses with, with translations that have no... There's not a manuscript on planet Earth that says what they say. And everyone's like, oh, yes, and the NIVs. And, the, and now we're all Hebraic. We've got, everyone's got their David Stern complete Jewish Bible. Let's look at those outrageous translations and let's see what the real scripture says. Knowing that a man is not ever declared right by works of the law, but by the emunah, the faith in Yahushua HaMashiach. Mashiach, even we who have believed in Yahushua HaMashiach, that we might be declared Zadik, righteous, by the emunah, the faith in Moshiach. Not by the works of law, for by works of law shall no flesh ever be declared zadik, righteous. Works of law, it's the Greek word ergon nomo. Three times in Galatians 2.16 we see that. Ergon nomo, for a total of six times in the book of Galatians Chapter 3, verse 2, 5, and 10 added. And we find it again in Romeo, Paul addressing the Romans, chapter 3, verse 20, and verse 28. And it is outrageous to me when I look at these translations. NIV, knowing that a man is not ever declared right by observing the law. You lying mama. I mean, non-existent. But man, does that all, that justifies your lawlessness and syncretism, doesn't it? But there, the Bible says you're not declared right by observing the law. There we go, pack up your stuff and off you go. Right? Wrong. 
But the New English Bible is no better, knowing that a man is not ever declared right by doing what the law demands. <laughs> right? I don't even think my five-year-old would fall for that. But the complete Jewish Bible is even more outrageous because it's kind of very twisting legalistic observance of Torah commands. <laughs> Where do you get that legalistic observance of Torah commands? Now you can have Torah, Torah, Torah and be a Torah terrorist, right? Legalistic observance of Torah commands based upon no textual evidence. You see, so we pick up these dreadful habits in the institutionalized church and then just drag them into the messianic movement. But now, because it's pro-Torah, it's acceptable. It's not. It's We need to have equal weights and measures. If you're going to take issue with the NIV and the NEB, you need to take issue with the Hebraic translations that are making it up and the Aramaic translations that are making it up and faking it too. Because the Bible clearly teaches us what this is about. Works of law, ergon no more. So let's look at the common four interpretations of what this mysterious works of law is. Number one, we've got the institutionalized church interpretation. Well, of course, works of law means keeping the law of Moses, his customs, and his commands therein. We're all familiar with that doctrine, right? Number two, the messianic interpretation. Trying, works of law means trying to attain justification by keeping the law of Moses. That doesn't mean that we don't keep the law of Moses, but we just rightly apply it, which of course they never do. Right? And then you come up with the translation, well, it's really talking about just legalistic observance of Torah commands. But that's not true. Then we have the third Karite interpretation, which is Avi Ben Mordecai and Michael Rood. It's an oral law, traditions of the rabbis and the elders. That's what the works of law is. It's the oral law. That one really, like I say, that one, you know, that one, that one's special to me. And finally spending a little bit more time and being a bit more constructive and being a, more of a critical thinker because I smell a rat in both the institutionalized church and the Hebrew roots movement. And I had to be like, well, you know, yeah, but no. The Malkit Zedek view, works of the law is the labor of the book of the law, Galatians 3.10, text, as opposed to the rest of the newly blood ratified covenant of inclusion, which is the book of the covenant community, chapter 4, verse 21. So works of law is the works of the law is the labor of the book of the law, Galatians 3.10. Works of law isn't speaking so much about obedience to Elohim as the institutionalized church falls prey to interpreting it as, as much as it really addresses how a group, a group, a sect, follow, divide, and interpret his law as appropriate to the dynamics of their faith. Did you catch that? We, as the Malkit Zedek priesthood sect, we are supposed to follow divide and interpret his law as appropriate to the dynamics of our faith, which is a book of the covenant reality. Why? So we can rightly divide it. What enables, enables us to be part of the Israel of Elohim, Galatians 6 verse 16? Is it circumcision? Is it the book of the law? Is it pagan syncretism and Jesus? Or is it Yahushua's blood ratification that establishes the new book of the covenant given as Torah? What includes you into the Israel of Eloah? Galatians 6.16. Now the Dead Sea Scrolls, manuscript 4, QMMT, really ties this up nicely. Because 
that manuscript uses Masech Torah, the Hebrew equivalent of Ergon Nomo, to define, listen, this is key, to define rules of conduct and inclusion into the Dead Sea Scrolls community based upon their interpretation of the book of the law. Dead Sea Scrolls manuscript for QMMT, Masecha Torah, the equivalent of Ergon Nomo in the Greek, defines rules of conduct and inclusion into the Dead Sea Scrolls community based upon the community's interpretation of the book of the law. The book of the law... All right, I got... There we go. I'd just like to say that I've always been impressed with Duracell, and I really have never bloody trusted those rechargeable batteries. I never have. I always go, I do. When I go to the shop, I'm always going for the copper knob. Simple as that. You can take your bloody rechargeable batteries, and you can give them to somebody else. As far as I'm... Where were we? Were we t what were we talking about? Oh, we were talking about... Th somebody's paying attention. I was thinking about dinner, which isn't going to happen for another 11 blooming days. Thank you, <laughs> Gary Tunksky. <laughs> Gee, whoever introduced me to that man? I don't know. I've been depressed ever since I met him. <laughs> I eat for comfort. Some more fruit tea. Can't even have an English cup of tea for 21 days. <sighs> I love you, Gary. Being facetious. Oh, really? Oh, okay. I feel good, though. I do. I really do. I've got a lot of energy. A lot of energy. That green juice, you know, just going through the veins. Mm. Yeah, it's gross. But, you know, it does, it does good things for you. It makes a body fit. Back to the text of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We were looking at the manuscript for QMMT and how this succinctly locks in what does the Greek phrase ergon nomo, works of law, or the Hebrew equivalent, which of course is Masecha Torah. What does it mean? Well, we find that in the Dead Sea Scrolls community, the rules of conduct and inclusion into the Dead Sea Scrolls community was based upon their interpretation of the book of the law. Deuteronomy, the book of the law, there in particular there was 25 copies of the book of the law, how they interpret, interpreted your inclusion into the community was based upon their understanding of the book of the law. Based upon Galatians 3.10, Galatians 4.16, and now Dead Sea Scrolls Manuscript 4 QMT, MMT, with more than 25 copies of the book of the law that were unearthed at Qumran, the evidence that Ergon Nomo, or the Hebrew equivalent, Masei Chatora, works of law, is identifiable once and for all as the book of the law. It's unequivocal. It's totally solid. Because when you look at Galatians 3.10, when you look at Galatians 4.16, and you understand that manuscript 4QMMT, they interpreted the inclusion of anybody into the community was based upon their interpretation of the book of the law and how it related to community inclusion. And that's exactly what's going on in Galatia. Are you included in the community or are you not? Are you in or are you out? Shaul, he is criticizing a sectarian observance of the book of the law because it impedes the mission of blessing. 
And that was Avraham's mission, wasn't it? To be a blessing to the nations and inclusion. It wasn't about separatism. It was about inclusion. The blessing of Abraham to all nations. Rather than general Torah observance, as the institutionalized church would interpret works of law, or the non-existent textual witness to a manufactured oral law that variant streams of the Messianic or Hebrew roots would have you believe. Though, like I say, one of those interpretations, the written law and the oral law, false dichotomy, it did pull at my heartstrings many years ago. Because we do see today, by looking at this with fresh eyes, that works of law, ergo nomo, manifests itself. We even see this. It manifests itself with exclusivity. You're not part of the community. And I, being entrenched and traveling all over the nation in the Messianic movement teaching for over a decade, you see a lot of it in congregations. Every congregation's got their own halakha. And some of it is just outrageous. I'd go and speak at congregations, and you'd see it. You'd see these false constructs, these boundary markers that were constructed within the messianic movement and they were sectarian and it was their sectarian interpretation of the book of the law that clearly would distinguish well you're on the outside you're not in the inside well this 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 community we have long beards and you don't you're clean shut you're out well this community we hand tie our seat seat you bought your you're out your seat seat, well, we do different colors. We just don't do the blue and the white. We do the blue, of course, but we do all of the colors that are in the tabernacle. You're out. You're not in our community. Oh, she's wearing pants. She's out. Oh, she's got makeup. Oh, my goodness. She's got makeup on. She's out. Messianic Hebrew roots. She's out. Oh, she curled her hair and she isn't wearing a bedspread wrapped on her head. She's out. Do you think I'm joking? Me showing up like this, a leather jacket and two days worth of stubble on my face with a little bit of wax in my hair. You're out. But I put on a head covering with the yod hey wav hey strap on some seat seats, grow this out for a month. I'm good to go, baby. I'm going to listen to every word he says. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. What, so we grow our beards long, put on a baseball cap so we look like Farmer Joe and we're in? I don't have to look like a ragamuffin to be in the, in, in the faith. You see, these are the things that I experienced over a decade. You're like, hmm, it's the same thing that was going on in the communities at the time of Rab Shaliak Shaul, applying the book of the law in a certain way that breeds exclusivity, and it's a spirit of religious judgmentalism. You're out. And the blessing to Abraham, the book of the covenant, is come in. Come in. We love you. We accept you. Let's learn of covenant talk. Come in. We don't care what you look like. We don't care what you smell like. Come on in. Come on in. And we don't, do we, brother? We really don't. So come on in. I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> come on in. Whosoever. Whosoever. You want to wear a turban? Rock it on. Just make sure it looks good. And it's clean. <laughs> but ding ding and all that. You see, we've got to be wary of customs that keep people out of Yahuwah's community rather than welcoming them, welcoming them in inappropriately applying the book of the law to restrict membership in the people of Elohim, the Israel of Eloah, Galatians 6.16. I don't want to be a part of that anymore. And I was, and I'm ashamed of it. 
And I think many people, if they're honest in the Messianic and Hebrew Roots movement, they're honest. There's a lot of exclusivity based upon outward appearance. And it's outrageous. And it's not right. And it goes against the covenants of promise. But in reality, this has nothing to do with the Sabbath. This has nothing to do with dietary requirements, this text. This has nothing to do with the feasts of Yahuwah, does it? Let's be honest. Because all of those are very much part of community and Book of the Covenant Torah living. Verse 17, but if while we seek to be declared righteous by Moshiach, we ourselves are also found to be sinners. Is therefore Moshiach now an Eved of sin in our lives? Let it never be. For if I build again the things that I destroyed, I make myself to be a transgressor. And of course, this takes us back to where we began, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, verse 14. Therefore, remember, you were once called Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made in their flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Messiah... You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the promises of Abraham, which were about inclusion, inclusion into covenant Torah. You had no hope. And do you know how many people have been met at the door of this assembly a decade ago? I mean, we had a fellow that would do everything but ask you to unzip and see if you were circumcised. I mean, he would, I mean, and some assemblies, they would do that for Passover. No, they really will. Oh, we had a, once a brother here at the door. He'd, like, he'd catch you at the door and he'd like put a tea cozy on your head. He would. You're not coming in, and you know, because that was his... That was his real, it was all about the head covering. So, you know, let's crochet up a tea cozy and boom, now, now you can come in. We had another brothers that would be checking for how long your seats eat. Well, I've seen it all. I've seen the lawlessness and I've seen the book of the law, syncretism to rabbinic. Both ways. And all of that now is experience to be able to rightly divide and navigate based upon now bringing in people from all over the world to the Sabbaths, the dietary requirements, and the feasts of Yahuwah, that you come just as you are, and we learn together. Because we want the truth. We don't want to get caught up in the mulberry bush. And we don't want to make out under mistletoe, as much as that used to be fun. We don't want to do that anymore. Right? Okay, because you're all with me except for the mistletoe there. Okay, I saw some of the brothers thinking back to her. Ooh, yeah. Sorry, wives. It's you filthy sinners. I would never think like that at all. Verse 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that might live to Yahuwah. Go figure that verse out, please, with your institutionalized church interpretation. I threw the law, I'm dead to... It makes no sense unless you have two Torahs. It makes no sense. I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live to Yahuwah. What are we talking about? By being obedient to Yahushua's blood ratification, covenant Torah, the book of the covenant, Shaul has died to the book of the law. The schoolmaster, the tutor, that was only until the time of reformation, until the seed would come. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 10. Done. Real simple. Why did it take me 45 years? I don't know. Because we are entrenched with these whispering religious voices all around, aren't we? All around. These false constructs that try and keep people out from the truth. Because it doesn't matter 
It's not about religion. It's about righteousness and seeking Him. Pray Psalm 119. Seek His truth and He will show you. I am crucified with Mashiach, verse 20. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Mashiach lives in me. My first love. You have got to cling to your first love. And the hyene, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of Yahweh, because he loves me. He loves you. That's a deep love. And it's a love that draws. I mean, I think of where I was and how he accepted me in that state. Oh, you that were abandoned by the side, and neither your mother washed you, and though you drip with blood, and you were abandoned by the side of the road, I picked you up, and I washed you, and I wrapped you in a fresh, and brought you to my bosom, saith Yahweh to his people. To his people. He gave himself for me, and I do not, I will not, and I shall not frustrate the unmerited favor of Yahuwah. For if righteousness came by the law, the book of the law, then Yahushua died in vain. If righteousness comes by the book of the law, then Yahushua died in vain. Rejoice, brethren, because now we, the saints, the Malkitzedic priests, have overcome the two biggest obstacles that have tripped up the saints since 130 of the common era. You, the two biggest obstacles. Number one, believing Shaul's words were antagonistic towards the Torah as a whole. We've overcome that obstacle. And number two, believing Shaul's words were antagonistic towards the oral law. We've overcome that obstacle too. And now we see a dichotomy between the book of the law that we are to be antagonistic toward because it was only there for a time. And I'm antagonist, antagonistic towards it because of the love I have for Yahushua and his blood established and blood ratified the new book of the covenant given as Torah, Jeremiah 31, 31, Hebrews 8, 6. The book of the law was not blood ratified. We have to understand that. We've discovered the key of knowledge. The key of knowledge. The book of the law and the book of the covenant dichotomy in relation to ratification, Torah, and the inclusion of Israel into the community with Elohim. Amen? Amen. Questions, comments? All right. Have, uh, two questions from the inner audience. Yes. First one is circumcised, circumcision necessary today for land entrance? Is circumcision um, necessary today for land entrance? That's a great question. <laughs> and I've heard it be answered. By, well, you can um, do it with stainless steel in a doctor's office. Or maybe you'll be out in the desert with a piece of flint and a gritty bit of sand. You know, I really do not see a command for it today. Now, if you do circumcise today, then just understand it would be according to the Joshua 5 land entrance key. And that's exactly what Ezekiel said when he went to the nations when he was in north of Babylon. That if they were to return according to that conditional covenant promise that they didn't take him up on, that, that they would still be under that land entrance. So some would say, yes, circumcision is for today as a land entrance token. But Yahushua says, circumcision is nothing. Your uncircumcision is nothing. Your circumcision is nothing. Because we have to enter into the covenant, and that is done by the circumcision of the hands of Yahushua. That's what the, that's what the scriptures teach. So really, I think um, flesh circumcision is a moot point. It really is. 
The next question has to do with ritual baptism. Was there any points of contention between the two groups, the Judaizers and the Galatians, in regards to baptism? Well, exactly. That's a great point. Because mikvaot, to them, was also a part of that inclusion. That was like circumcision, but for the women. Meaning, women would not be included into Israel unless they went through ritual immersion and adhered to their interpretation of the book of the law. Whereas males would have to then go on to proselyte conversion and then adhere to their interpretation of the book of the law. Dead Sea Scrolls confirms that. It's all about covenant inclusion and what keeps you in and what keeps you out. Excellent. Anybody else? Questions, comments at all? Thoughts? No? Blessings. Blessings. Well, I'm excited. I wasn't sure if I would be able to get through chapter 2 today because it's quite a lot. I hope I didn't lose you because there is a lot to cover, but I think we really tore down some false constructs and that to me is enlightening and encouraging. And I just pray, praise Yahweh for his long suffering as we try and navigate, and you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I am, I've got to admit, I'm radical. I always have been. And so, you know, the pendulum <laughs> swings right over there. I'm just, you know, boom. And then I come into Torah, <laughs> it swings over there. I mean, crazy radical. Either way, I mean, gung-ho. I mean, when I was in the church, I'm out on the streets. I'm just tackling people and, you know, like, yeah you've got to come to Jesus, you know? And people are like, this guy's nuts. And then, boom, over in the Torah, the next thing you know, people are like, oh. So, you know, I think that I'm growing up as we're growing up, and I'm hoping now we're kind of somewhere, and occasionally I get over it, and okay, but, you know, it's that really trying to, trying to tack that course of maturity. So I praise Yahweh for his long suffering with us all. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. Stick around and Shabbat Shalom. Say hello to new people. And um, we have several here. Please make sure that you make friends and bless one another.